tested. Hi, I'm Will Smith with Tested.com. Today, we're gonna show you how to build a PC. All you need are the parts here, about an hour, screwdriver, and uh, the handy video. It's really easy to do, and we can show you exactly what you need to know to do it. So the first thing we're gonna do is put some components in the motherboard. Before we do that, let's talk about the stuff we need to get ready. First, I like to have a little bowl. I put all the screws in it. It's uh, really handy to, so you, so you don't lose any little parts, um, you know, whether you're building this on your kitchen table, living room, whatever. Uh, next thing, screwdriver, very important. We're not gonna use it in this step, but you'll need it in just a moment. The third thing is talking about electrostatic discharge. Um, lots of people are really concerned about accidentally torching their electronics with ESD. If you follow a few really simple precautions, it's not really that much of a problem. Basically, before you touch anything that could be damaged by static, static electricity, <laughs> all you need to do is, is touch something so you'll be grounded. So touch your case, touch a, um, an electrical outlet, not you know, with a fork or anything, just the screw on it. Um, touch touch uh, the floor or the table or a TV or something like that. Okay, so here's the motherboard. This is Asus's uh, P7P55D, which is a P55 board. It has a socket 1156 uh, Intel socket on it. It's, I mean, basically the only choice you have if you want an Intel P55 board. Um, it's a relatively nice one. It's not anything super fancy. There's not crazy lights or anything like that. But it's a really good board. It's perfectly serviceable, and that's why we like it. So the first thing we're going to do is put the CPU in. We're using an Intel quad core. It's the uh, I, it's an i5. It's again a socket 1156 processor. It's uh, an i5 750. Um, and the nice thing about buying retail Intel processors is they not only come with the CPU, they also come with the cooler. So that means you don't have to buy any thermal paste. You don't have to spend an extra 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 dollars on an aftermarket cooler solution. You can just use this guy right here. The next thing to talk about is the CPU. If you haven't built a computer in a long time, or you uh, you have never built a computer. The first thing you need to know about Intel CPUs is there's no pins on the CPU itself. See, it's just a flat surface with a lot of little contacts. The pins are all on the motherboard. To get access to the pins, the first thing we need to do is take out this little protector. It ships with the, ships with the machine. You definitely want to keep it because if you ever have to ship the board back for warranty coverage or something like that, you want to put this back in instead of the CPU before you send it back to the vendor. So to get it out, you, you grab this guy, pop it out. You see, it has a little protector. Pull it back and the socket flips back. Then just lift the plastic guy, it will pop out. Just lift it straight up and there you can see the socket. Tons and tons of little pins. To put this back in the bowl where it'll be safe. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that comes with motherboards typically. You have a PATA cable. This is an old parallel ATA cable. We're not gonna use this, probably you won't either. It's um, kind of an old thing. Nobody uses them anymore. The next thing are a whole bunch of SATA cables. ASUS is really good because they give uh, right angle cables, which you use to you know, hook on the motherboard end so that they can go underneath a video card or something like that. Uh, we will use those, so we're going to keep those on the side here. And then the last thing you'll usually see is the ATX backplane connector. This guy goes between the ports on the motherboard and the case to kind of pretty up the whole thing. Uh, it prevents EM leakage and it makes it better airflow so you don't collect a whole bunch of dust around your USB ports and, uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to hold on to that too. The last thing, which is probably my favorite thing about ASUS motherboards, are these guys. What these are is front panel, they, they connect to the front panel headers on the motherboard and they make it much easier for you to hook the things like lights and, and USB ports into the case. Okay, so now it's time to put the CPU in the socket. The thing you're gonna wanna look for is this triangle in the lower right corner of the CPU. It actually, there's a mark on the, on the socket. There's a little tiny triangle in there and, and it lines up with this triangle here. The CPU only goes in one way. See, there's a rectangular hole and a rectangular hole. And you wanna lower it in and just get it straight down and just drop it into place. Once it's down, don't wiggle it if you didn't get it in place. Just lift it up and try again. You won't hurt anything doing that. But if you move it from side to side, you can hook one of the pins and pretty much destroy the motherboard or at least spend a lot of time with a, with a um, mechanical pencil trying to fix it later, which is a drag. So to lock the CPU into place, see we're, we're, we're held in place by these two posts on either side of the socket. All you do is push this down. You wanna get the, the two kind of flanges around this pin here and then push down. It takes a fair amount of force there's only a few things you'll use force on when you're building a computer. This is one of them. The next one is memory, which we're gonna do right now. So this is Patriot DDR3 memory. Uh, we're, since we're doing a P55 board, we only need two channels of memory. Uh, so, I mean, two sticks inside the case. Let's pop those open. Um, this is a, a pretty good memory. It's not super expensive. If you're not planning on overclocking, you don't need to spend money on really crazy expensive uh, RAM. It's just not, not something that you need to spend money on. Now, when you're handling these components, one of, the, one of the golden rules 
is don't touch the gold parts. Don't touch the connectors. This stuff right here, this stuff right here. As long as you don't touch that, it's kind of hard to damage with electroshock. The thing to remember with this kind of board is it's a dual channel board. So that means if you don't put the memory in the right slot, then you're actually not going to get the full performance of the memory that you're buying. Uh, on these ASUS boards, it's actually blue memory. The blue slots are the primary slots. So you want to line up the, the RAM. I'm just going to set that piece down here. Line it up with the, see the, the slot is keyed, the slot is keyed here. There's a notch, a notch and a groove. So we're going to line it up on this side, line it up on the other side, and just push down. And it'll just click into place. And you do want to apply a fair amount, a fair amount of force there. Again, about five or 10 pounds of pressure, but not much more than that. Uh, it's important to make sure you're on a flat surface when you do this. I prefer to do it actually outside of the case on the table uh, because then there's something supporting the board underneath when you push down. So push that one down, clicks into pace, and you can see the, the levers on the side when you push it down, snap, snap closed. And so we're not going to put the cooler in now until we get it in the case because it's a little harder to do. Uh, so next thing to do, I guess, is to actually put the drives and the motherboard into the case. Okay, so now <laughs> you can see we have our case. It's a Cooler Master Storm Sniper. It's a great enthusiast case. Um, has a lot of cooling built in, doesn't come with a power supply, we'll talk about that in a little bit, or I guess you can get it as an option. The one we got didn't, I'm perfectly comfortable with that. Uh, the thing I like about this most, there's a great big knob on the front that controls fan speed, so when you're using the computer and you need to exhaust a bunch of heat, then you can turn the fans up. When you don't need that and you don't want to hear the noise, you can turn it down. So let's flip it over on its side, we're going to open it up. We'll start with the optical drive first, because it's actually the easiest. This is a Samsung SH223, rather. It's a SATA optical drive. It's a DVD writer and reader. So you know, we don't need really a burner, a Blu-ray reader, or anything like this. It's a relatively inexpensive gaming machine. Um, in order to get the, the drive into place, you have to first pop out the front panel connector. You do that by reaching up through the five and a quarter inch drive bays. Um, and there's a connector on the left side of the case if you're facing forward. And you just basically squeeze these guys and it, it'll pop out. To put the optical drive in, first you need to make sure it's right side up. Line it up and just slide it really gently. Here we go. If it doesn't go in at first, then it could be that the button is pushed down. These buttons lock the drives into place and they have these little pins that pop out. And, and when the pins pop out, then they basically hold the drive, um, they prevent the drive from sliding in. So slide it in until it's flush with the front bezels. You can do it with the braille method. Push the button and it'll lock into place. Next up are the hard drives. We have two drives in this machine. The first is an Intel SSD. So an SSD is a solid state hard drive. It, that means it's basically flash memory uh, instead of a, a spinning platter. So the upshot of that is you get really fast transfer speeds, really incredibly fast read speeds, just like you would on a USB thumb drive or a flash, flash drive, something like that. Uh, but the sacrifice is they're really expensive and the capacity can be kind of low. So we bought a relatively cheap X25M 80 gigabyte drive, and, and we're going to use that for Windows and applications and things that we use frequently and want to have really quick load times. And then we're going to pair that with, a, with an inexpensive one terabyte hard drive. So that's this guy. It's a Seagate 7200.12, I believe, one terabyte drive. Uh, so we'll put games, media files, video, stuff like that on this drive. So we save the space for the 80 gig uh, SSD. So first I'm going to put this guy in because he's a little bit easier. In order to install the drives in this machine, the way you do it, they're all in drive caddies. It's really, really dead simple. Uh, you, what you do is you release the lever, slide it out. You bend the caddy back a little bit so you can get the pins. Uh, see the pins into the holes on both sides. And it's okay to flex the caddy a little bit. It bends quite nicely. And then you just slide it back in. Make sure the little the lever is underneath the flange on the on the right side facing the drives and snap it into place. It's installed, it's not connected yet. We'll do that in just a second. Um, the SSD is a little bit trickier because it doesn't fit into this drive cage. Luckily, we bought the retail version of Intel's SSD, which comes with a caddy that'll let us put it into this guy and, and you know install just like a normal hard drive. The only thing we want to make sure is that the SSD is lined up with the back edge of the of the um, caddy. So uh, so it's just so it's easier to plug in. It doesn't really matter other than that. So what I'm going to do is flip this over. You can see the holes line up with the four stripes or strips that are cut out here. Oops. It's a little harder than I would have thought when I'm holding it, but we'll see how it goes. So take our novelty oversized screwdriver here and just get it started. You don't want to cinch it all the way down just in case you twist or something and, and lose, up, lose alignment with one of the screws. Um, now the nice thing about SSDs is, is there's no moving parts, so they tend to not wear out 
as quickly or as, be as easily broken as hard drives if you put them in a laptop or something like that. Um, we're not worried about that as, such a, as much in a desktop. The nice thing is instant loading of your applications, which is totally awesome. I'm going to cinch them down now, so make, make sure that everything's in good and tight. Like I said, I'm less concerned about vibration, more concerned about just having it in well. I'm going to pop out the second of the caddies, line up the holes. See, popping it into place. And there we have it. Just slides in just like a normal hard drive. A little bit thinner. Okay, so hard drives, optical drives in place. It's time to put the motherboard in. This is um, probably the harder thing that you're going to do. It's a little tricky getting it all wedged into place and then getting it screwed down. Uh, so we're going to go through it really slowly and we'll show you exactly, exactly what you need to know. First thing I'm going to do is untie all of these cables. They come shipped from the manufacturer with twist ties um, just to, so I can get them out of the way. We're not going to do anything with them right now, but we do want them out of the way when we're putting everything into the machine. So here's the motherboard. Before we do this, this is important, uh, we want to get that ATX backplane connector that we showed you before, and it actually goes into the case right down here. I'm going to use two hands for this because it's a little bit tricky. Um, you want to make sure that the, that the ATX connectors, the, the PS2 connectors rather, are toward the top of the case, so you want to make sure it goes in the right way, otherwise it can be really hard to fit. So here we go. We're sliding it in. So the ATX backplane is in place. The next step, installing the motherboard. So typically, motherboard has nine holes. You can see them on the bottom easier than on the top. There's three on the top, three in the middle, and three down on the bottom, sometimes four down on the bottom. So you need to make sure that there's nine holes in the case to screw the motherboard into. We're going to do that right now. Your case should have come with a whole bunch of these little bra brassy kind of uh, standoffs. So you screw these into the, into the case, and then you screw the motherboard into them. There's two holes up here, so I'm going to screw a third one over, over here, because that's where one of the holes is in the motherboard. If you have a little driver, a hex driver, that fits these types of screws, much easier to do it than doing it with your hands. Okay, so uh, all of the motherboard standoffs are in. I lined them up with the motherboard, you know, dropped it in, kind of eyeballed it. Everything looks like it lines up. I know how many there are, I'm gonna, so I'm going to count the screws as I put them in and make sure that I have the same number of screws going in as, as, uh, as I have standoffs on the board. It's really important you do that because if you accidentally put one in the wrong place and have all this electronic stuff on the bottom of the motherboard touching the standoff, you can short out the board and cause hardware damage or you know, maybe just the machine won't work. Either way, it's a pain in the ass and you have to take the motherboard all the way out to fix it. So we want to avoid that. Okay, so I'm lowering this in. I can tell everything lines up because the connectors line up over here with the ATX header connector. I need to push a little bit in, and you can tell, you can see, you, know, you don't want to push on the memory like I just did, that's pretty bad. Um, but you can see, you can see the standoffs through the holes, which is really, really convenient. And that tells me I'm in pretty good shape. So I'm going to get some screws, and I'm going to start screwing this into place. So when you're screwing the motherboard into place, it's really important, uh, you want to use the same kind of uh, like spare tire rules that you use when you're changing your tire. You want to do screws that are opposite diagonally across the board from each other to start. So you don't end up with the board twisted or in the wrong, in the wrong position. Um, so don't over tighten. That's really important. You want to just do, just get them, just hold it in place to begin with and then come back and do a tightening pass after you get every, all the screws in. So I've got four screws in so far. Like I said, important to keep count just because, you know, you don't want to have, have to do this and then take it all apart and do it again. That's a real pain in the ass. Okay, so motherboard's in the case. Uh, now it's time to start putting components in. Uh, we're gonna put the cooler on, and then we're gonna connect everything together and power it up and see how it works. So the next step is to put the cooler that came with the CPU into the socket and uh, you know, connect it to power. Now usually when you're putting a cooler in a case in a, in, on a CPU, you wanna have some sort of a, what's called a thermal, thermally conductive material on the bottom that goes between the CPU and the cooler and kind of evens out any cracks or holes or pits or something like that. Um, what that does is helps it transfer heat more efficiently, which is really important when you consider that these processors are putting off a couple hundred watts sometimes. Uh, when you buy a retail cooler, it's already pre-applied by Intel or AMD, depending on which manufacturer you use, so you don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, you just want to make sure that you don't take the CPU, take the cooler off and put it back on, take it off and put it on. So what I'm going to do is unwrap the cord first. You can see it comes up under here. It's a little bit of a funny way to store it, but I guess it works for Intel. I'm sure they've tested it. 
Um, and then I'm going to look and see where the, where the connector is, where the CPU fan connector is. Uh, it's right here. So I'm going to look and see how this is going to line up and, and where I can do it so that the cable doesn't have a whole lot of extra slack. So it looks like if I put it in this way, with it hooked into the little connector here, then, it, then it'll fit perfectly. If you use a different motherboard and it's someplace else, sometimes they're up on this edge, sometimes they're back here. Just, I mean, kind of eyeball it, think about how it's going to work before you get started. The way these Intel coolers work is you just push them down, they snap into place, and then to remove it, you twist the, twist the connector with a flat screwdriver and it'll pull back out. Uh, we don't want it to be in that position now, so they should all be, uh, basically the direction the arrow points on these connectors is the loose position. If, you're, if your connector is turned the other way, like that's, that moves, you can see. This, not so much. So uh, when we push this down, it's gonna snap it into place. If it was the other way, it would just pop right back out again. So we wanna make sure it's in the right orientation. And if you look, all four of them are the right way. So we're gonna push it down. Again, spare tire rules. So do one corner, push down until it clicks, you heard that? Push down until it clicks, push down until it clicks, push down until it clicks. Super easy, um, very little way to screw that up. Uh, next step, we're gonna connect the front panel connectors. We'll start with USB, because that's probably the easiest. And you can see the case has all of these front panel headers. The data ones are usually wrapped in a tan or a black cable. The ones that are just loose are for things like the power button and the reset switch and, and stuff like that. Uh, so we're gonna ignore those for right now. And these are all labeled. So this one is the front panel audio connector. It says HD audio. This one's USB. Uh, this one's USB. This one's 1394, which is Firewire. So what you wanna do is look on the motherboard and see which ones are which. Uh, what you'll see about all of these different connectors is that they're keyed. So that means one pin is blocked, so you can't plug it in. So it, for the most part, won't go into the wrong port. The exception is, of course, 1394 and USB. If you screw that up and plug the 1394 port into a USB port or vice versa, it'll blow up whatever you plug in first. So you wanna make absolutely certain that what you're plugging in is actually 1394. Usually it's labeled on the board. See, so right here it says 1394. I'm gonna line that up, plug it in. Bam, that easy. This one says USB, I'm gonna do the same thing for the USB ports. These guys are all down here. These three are all USB ports. We're gonna plug each of them in too. Another USB port. So these are connecting the, the USB ports that are on the top front of the case uh, to the motherboard, which is really handy because you know you want that stuff to work. You expect to plug a thumb drive or something like that in there. You expect it to work. Uh, this one is HD audio. It doesn't have the little, uh, the little sheath around it, so it's a little bit harder to plug in but you can see it's keyed a little bit differently. You just slide it down here, make sure it lines up with all four of the, all six of the pins, or eight of the pins rather, and, and plug it into place. Uh, the next thing we're gonna plug in are the front panel connector, the rest of the front panel connectors. So the switches, um, the, the reset switch, the power switch, the hard drive activity light, the power activity light, all of that kind of stuff. And to do that, we're gonna use this handy little block. What this does is tells us exactly what plugs in where, and then rather than try to fiddle with each of these little tiny wires and get them all in the right plot place, we plug them in here and then plug this guy onto that, onto that thing. And they're even labeled. So the nice thing is, if you look, like this is the power, power switch, I mean, sorry, the power light. So this is the light that comes on when the power is on on the computer. And if you look at it, uh, let's see, this one is the power LED as well. And it says power LED positive, which is important to have uh, the right ones on the right ones and power LED minus. So we're gonna plug those two in. And uh, it's important when you're doing the lights especially that you get the positive on the positive and the negative on the negative. It won't break anything if you get it the wrong way. The light just won't light up, which is, you know, kind of makes me sad. Um, this is the power switch, so it looks like it's on the other side. And see, power switch. The power switches and the reset switch aren't uh, polarity. They don't, it doesn't matter whether they're positive or negative. You just have to close the circuit. So uh, that's not, that's not, it's not important that you get the plus and the minus right on that. Now the H hard disk light is, again, you have to have the plus and the minus. Usually the white wire is the negative and the red wire is the positive on the hard drive. So we're gonna plug that in. Hope that's right, pretty sure it is. If it's not, then we can just bust it open, switch it out in a little bit. Then the last one is the reset switch. It's right next to the power switch. I'm gonna plug that in. This motherboard, it looks like this case doesn't have a speaker, so we don't have to plug that in. And then getting it connected is as easy as making sure that you're lined up. So you can see, it says the reset corner is this corner. This is the reset switch, so I'm gonna line it up. Probably only goes on one way, but it's good to make sure you get it right the first time. And that's all connected, so it's really that easy. So then the last front panel connector is this uh, eSATA cable. It looks like the normal SATA cable. It's what you use to plug in the hard drive or the optical drive or whatever. 
Um, you can use any of these SATA ports down here. Generally, I like to reserve these guys over here for the actual hard drive that you boot off of because it's easier to set up the machine if you set the boot hard drive into the first SATA port and, and on down the line. So all I'm going to do is plug this into the one of these guys down here. It doesn't matter which one. Just avoid the, the two in the front here. Okay, so the next thing is the power supply. We're using a Corsair 650 watt power supply today. It's a modular design, which is really convenient because it means you don't have any extra cables that you don't need on the power supply. Uh, I mean, really, almost any power supply will work. The thing you want to do is make sure you have enough power from your power supply so that the CPU and the video card and everything have enough juice, uh, especially when it gets warm out. Because the thing is, power supplies produce less power the warmer they are. So, you know, you might be okay in the wintertime with a cheap power supply, but when August rolls around and it's 90 degrees in your computer room, it's going to crash when you fire up a game. So you don't want that. I mean, that's why I always spend a couple bucks more and get a power supply that actually produces a little bit more power and can thus run a little more efficiently than, than uh, I maybe need. There's a couple of different orientations you can put the power supply in the case. This case that we're using actually has vents in the bottom and it's raised up enough off the floor so that it's okay to, to, to have the fan on the power supply, the intake fan, against the bottom. If you don't have those vents, it may not be the best idea. Um, you can really shorten the life of the power supply if it runs too hot all the time. Uh, but because we have the vents and because they're on the bottom, I'm totally going to put it in that way because it'll be a lot quieter. Uh, so figure out what orientation is, line it up, slide it into place. Try not to catch too many wires. Uh, so look at the screws. They should line up exactly right. And uh, you know, that's, that, let's get those screwed in. Okay, so the power supply is screwed into place now. Next thing we're going to do is connect the hard drive, the optical drive, to both data and power. So we'll start with that by taking three SATA cables, because we have three drives in the system. So we have two right angle connectors and two not right angle connectors. Um, we're going to use the not right angle ends of all of these connectors on the motherboard side. And then we're going to use the right angle ones on the hard drives that go on the back of the, uh, you know, the other side of the case, because there's not a whole lot of clearance over there. So these guys are going to be uh, number one and number two. So this is SATA port one, this is SATA port two. This black one is connected to a third party controller, which you'll need to install drivers and stuff like that for. It's kind of a drag. I generally don't use it just because uh, you know, there's no reason to have it on if you don't actually need it. Um, and since we have six ports on the motherboard that don't require drivers, probably better to use the, the, the ones that are native. Um, so here we go. They just snap into place. And then these little metal clips lock them in so they don't come out when you lift. If you need to remove them, you can kind of pinch the metal clip and it lifts right out. Um, so we're going to connect all three while we're down here. Trying not to get other cables snarled up in here. Um, and then this third one we're gonna, is what we're going to use for the optical drive. And it can go in any of these other blue, any of these other blue SATA ports down here. Okay, so now we have data running into the motherboard. We have power coming from the power supply. But since it's a modular power supply, I'll need to get the, the special cables that you run from the power supply to the other components. I'll do that right now. The first thing we're going to do is look for some eSATA connectors. And let's see, neither of those are eSATA, of course. These are eSATA cables. You can tell they're kind of flat. Uh, they, have, they only go in one way, so they're keyed, so they only go one way. And you know, you'll use those to connect the optical drive, the SSD, and the hard drive. So the way these work is you plug them in here on the side of the power supply. They only go in one way, and they're, so they're keyed. Um, and we're going to use two of them in this, in this build. So there's one there. And here's the second one. Goes in right there. So what you want to do is run your power cables underneath all the other cables. Do the same thing for the data cable. Remember I said I was going to use the flat one for that. Um, and just plug them in up here. They only go one way. Like the other end of the data cable, it snaps into place. So once it's in, it's a little bit harder to remove, which is kind of good because you don't want to lose that and, and be sitting wondering why you can't install a game or whatever. Uh, and then we're going to snap the data cable in the same exact way. It's really easy. You hear, hear it click into place, and you should be good to go. The next thing we're going to do is plug in the hard drive and SSD to power and data as well. So I'm going to go around to the other side, feed through some cables, which is really super important. Um, and you want to run them through the front of the case, through this gap, and up the back is the best way to do it, I've found. Doesn't matter which order you plug them in, just make sure they're both plugged in good and that you kind of push the slack. The slack can push out of the way when you close the case. Finally, data cable for the hard drive. 
right up here, snapping that into place and you should be good to go. While I have this side of the case off, what I'm going to do is run some power cables up the outside edge and then back in either up here or around here so that they're out of the way and convenient and you don't have to look at them. So this guy is the supplemental power connector, ATX power connector. It's an 8-pin cable. What I've done is pulled it from the power supply. I'm going to run it up the back of the motherboard and the actual connector is right down here just on the other side of this hole. So that way I don't have to run the cable across all the components and all that. It you know, looks better. It isn't a big drag. So string it out through this hole up here and we'll connect it in just a second. We're going to do the same thing with this guy. This is the main ATX power connector. He's going to come out right over here. So we're just going to run him through that bottom hole too. So it's out of the way and looks just a little tiny bit better. The next thing we're going to do is connect the ATX supplemental power connector. It's this 8-pin this connector. The other end is right here, right above the CPU. It has a little cover on it, which we're going to pop off. Um, and it only goes in one way, so you don't have to worry about it too much. On this particular board, the latches go in on the top. And, it's, and because some boards only require four pins and some require eight, usually the power supply has this kind of split eight-pin connector. So it's a little tricky to plug in. Um, if, you need to, if you have trouble, you can actually do one side at a time. Just make sure that the right side is on the right side and the left side is on the left side, or else bad things happen. And it should click, and everything should be flush. Clicked into place. Everything's good. Um, the next thing, and this is the last big power connector we're going to do, is the 24-pin ATX power connector. Uh, what this does is provides main power to the system. It controls when the PC turns on, stuff like that. Really an important connector. Machine won't work without it. So uh, what we're going to do, again, because some machines have 20 pins and some machines have 24 pins, uh, there's actually another part that you can kind of break off. This one isn't broken apart. We're not going to break it apart because I want it to stay together. It's much easier to put in if it's all in one piece. Uh, so the latch on this one is toward the optical and hard drives. And you just slide it in. So the final piece is the video card. It's a Radeon 5870 HD from Sapphire. So the video card comes in this big giant foam static bag. Um, I'm still pretty grounded because I've been touching the case and the computer. Again, you don't want to touch the gold contacts. That's always bad. A couple of things you need to know. First, there's two six-pin power connectors on this end, so we'll want to plug those in after we have the board in the slot. Um, but getting it in the slot is just like pretty much any other PCI or PCI Express card. Uh, the first thing you want to do is remove the slot covers for the two slots. It's the two-slot board uh, that, that you're going to put, slide the board into. So in this case, you push down on the top end and kind of slide these guys back. They're toolless. Then you can pull the covers out and just put them aside. I'll put them in my screw bowl. Um, and then you want to slide this card down into the machine, making sure you keep it uh, lined up with the slot properly. And uh, you don't want to apply too much pressure, especially if you don't have it in the right place. The nice thing about this machine is it's a great big case. There's plenty of room on either side, so you can actually see what you're doing. You don't always have that luxury because sometimes there's a bunch of big fans and stuff over here. So this is in pretty good place. I'm going to push it down, snap it into place. Everything looks good. I'm going to click the little toolless guys back in, and the board is, is locked into place. The last thing we need to do is actually run power to the video card. Because this is a big gaming card, you actually need supplemental power or else it'll crash out and bad things will happen. Probably won't even work. I've not tried to run one without it, so I don't really know what happens. Um, to do that, we have this cable that came with the power supply. It has two PCI Express by 6 connectors on one end and a 6-pin six connector on the other end. There's only a couple of slots on the power supply that you can plug it into. I'm just going to pick one at random. So, bam, snaps into place. Uh, you can run it however you want. We have a giant snarl of cables in here, so I'm not too worried about how it looks. Uh, I'm just going to run these guys in here. And the latches are on the side of the board facing away from the PCB. So you can actually connect them right here and right here. Okay, so all the hardware is wired up. The only thing that remains is to plug the fans back in that we disconnected when we first started out. Um, you have a couple of choices when you're doing that. You can either plug them back into the fan bus controller on the front of the case, that's this guy up here, and the, use the knob to control fan speed. Or you can plug them directly into the motherboard and let the motherboard control the fan speed. Um, I, I kind of go, you know, I, I don't have a preference really on this. It's really up to you. If you want to have the really super granular control and have to turn everything up, you might actually get it a little bit quieter uh, by using the fan bus when you're idle. However, you have to remember to turn it up when you, when you start using your computer. Um, I'm going to plug into the motherboard just because I think it's a little bit easier and a little less maintenance. Uh, so this is the back fan. We're going to run this guy in right here. There's a fan connector right here. Um, this is a three-pin fan connector, and it's a four-pin header on the motherboard. So you want to use the three pins. If you can see, there's these two little notches here, and they'll slide over uh, a piece of plastic. 
So they, you only use three of the pins, that's totally okay. Nothing bad will happen there. So sliding that into place. Conveniently, there's a plug on the back side of the case labeled power in. I ran an extra four pin Molex connector from the power supply. And what I'm gonna do is just connect that guy in here, just like this. Computer's built, everything's ready to go. I've hooked up a monitor, mouse, and keyboard. Uh, only thing left to do is to power it up and see if, see if it actually works. I always recommend waiting to put the case doors back on until after you make sure it's booting and, uh, and all that, just because you know, it's a pain in the ass to put them back on and then have to take them off and then put them back on again and then take them off. So wait until it works. You're not going to hurt anything by leaving it open while it's running. It works just fine. So uh, the power switch is on in the back. I'm going to reach up here, hit the power switch in the front. Something's on my fan. Okay, so I'm going to turn that off. See what's touching the fan. Ah, so there's a, there was a wire up here at the top of the CPU touching my CPU fan just a little bit. It was just a little bit too tight. So I'll give it a little bit more slack by pushing around the edges. Should be back in business now. So let's try it. Fire it back up again. Ah, listen to that. Quiet, peaceful. There we go. Looks like we're posting. I'm going to press the tab key so I can see the boot up stuff. Okay, so this error message is just fine. All it's saying is that we don't have anything installed on the boot devices, nothing set up in the BIOS yet. So what we're going to do is go downstairs, capture a little bit of video there, showing you how to set up the BIOS um, and how to install Windows, and we will see you in just a minute. Uh, so right now the computer's booting up. I'm going to press delete to go into the BIOS. This is the main screen. Everything else is more or less okay. Let's look at storage and make sure everything's cool there. Um, configure SATA as... You want to probably switch that to AHCI, uh, just so that you uh, can take advantage of hot swap and all that stuff should you ever upgrade to that in the future. And it'll make your SSDs run a little bit better in Windows 7, which we're getting ready to install. You can leave everything in AHCI configuration alone. Um, AI tweaker we're not going to fool with. Um, advanced tab CPU configuration just tells us what we have installed and it lets you turn on uh, different CPU features. You want virtualization on so that if you run VMs in the future, they run faster and better. Everything else looks pretty good, so I'm gonna press escape and go back out to the main advanced menu. Um, Uncore just tells us, we don't even need to know this, not a big deal. Onboard devices is USB audio and the secondary LAN controller. So we want the audio controller turned on, we want the LAN turned on, we want Firewire turned on, that's 1394. Uh, we can turn off this J-Micron eSATA PADA controller. That's the one that was the black port and the PADA port on the motherboard. You're not using it if you set up the machine like we did, and it's just extra stuff to, to boot that takes time when you boot. Uh, same thing for serial ports. We're going to turn that off as well because nobody uses serial port anymore. Um, USB configuration defaults are totally okay. Um, PCI, PNP, we want to change that to yes, actually. Uh, we're going to leave VTD off. Uh, power mode, we want to set that to S3 only. Um, ACPI, A ACPI2 will turn on. Um, I don't know what EUP is. Not going to turn that on. All of this stuff is okay. If you want your machine to run a little quieter, you can turn QFAN on. Um, I set silent. We have a lot of fans in this machine, so it's not that big a deal. Everything else is okay. Um, so uh, in the boot menu, we set boot priority. So that controls what order the, the system looks at drives to see what, what, you know, when it loads the OS and things like that. So we're going to set it so that it boots off of the SSD first. Um, so you can tell this one says Intel SSD S whatever, that's the model number. Uh, the second device is going to be the CD-ROM. And then the third device we're just going to disable because those are the only two things we're ever going to want to boot off of. Um, hard disk drives, that's fine. We can disable the Seagate drive and just leave the SATA drive. This doesn't turn off the device, it just turns it off so that it doesn't look for it in the boot order. So that helps you save time on boot up as well. And then the last, this, this stuff we don't actually need to look at right now. This lets you save all the BIOS settings once you know everything's working so that should you have to reinstall BIOS or something, you can restore your settings quickly and easily. Um, so I'm gonna exit and save changes. Press OK. Um, and then I'm going to put the, the Windows 7 disk in the optical drive. Press tab to see what's happening. Now it should say, when you're getting ready to install Windows, it should say press any key to boot off of the optical drive. Windows is loading files. Because it didn't detect anything on the existing hard drives, probably didn't give us that option. So uh, if you ever boot off of the Windows disk later, then it'll almost certainly give you that choice. Okay, so now we're on the very first screen. Uh, as you can see, my mouse works, my keyboard works. Um, I speak English, I, my time and currency format should be English for the United States, and I use a US keyboard. 
If you want to switch that to Dvorak or Czechoslovakian or something like that, you can totally do that here. I'm interested to see what the Wolof keyboard is, but not enough to actually select that and then have to figure out how to fix it later. Pressing next, pretty simple, click install now. Um, really installing Windows is dead simple. The only thing you can mess up on is installing Windows to the wrong hard drive. Uh, because we have that SSD and the SSD is really fast reads, we definitely don't want to install Windows on, on, on the Seagate, the traditional hard drive, uh, because then we have an 80 gig, $200 kind of something we're going to use for very little. Um, I want to do a custom upgrade. So I have two choices here. One is 935 gigabytes. One is 74.5 gigabytes. The one that's 74.5 gigabytes is the SSD. So let's install there. Um, we can give it a name or any of that stuff. I'm not even going to bother. I'm just going to let it go nuts. So now it's going to copy files over and install. This will take oh, anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes, depending on how fast the machine is and how fast the optical drive is. I would think probably with the SSD, it should be stupid fast. OK, so now it's time to type in the product key and activate Windows. You have a couple of options here. You don't actually have to do that quite yet. And since you just built your own computer, and likely there's a lot of hardware that doesn't have drivers installed yet, it's a pretty good idea to not do that. Um, so what you do is you just don't type a key in, uncheck the automatically activate Windows when I'm online button, and press next. Now it's going to ask you, oh actually it doesn't because it's not Windows Vista. Um, on the protect and improve Windows automatically, I usually just use recommended settings. Uh, date and time seem to be okay. So it's going to finalize and probably uh, kick me to a login screen. Okay, so uh, now Windows is uh, set up. It's connected to the network. We're on a work network because I'm at work. Um, can I hit close? And the first thing you want to do is probably hit Windows Update. Let's see if it's going to let us. We might not be able to. Actually, the easiest way to find Windows Update is to go over here and type Windows Update. Update. And then press Enter. 20 important updates are available. One optional update. These are all security updates. Definitely good things to install. Let's see what this one is. Mm, that's activation hacks. Let's see if there's optional stuff. Install graphics card drivers. It's probably going to want to reboot before we can do that. So let's go ahead and download this stuff. You guys can marvel at how speedy our internet is here. This should take no more than 45 minutes or an hour, like 70 megs. Windows installed. Install updates from Windows Update. Install the new drivers from Windows Update. Download and install your video card drivers. Um, check. Always check device manager, make sure there's no exclamation, exclamation points. Um, and you can get to device manager really easily by right clicking on computer and going to manage. So no exclamation points, which means that the machine has basically all the drivers on the disk already for everything, except for the graphics card. You can tell because we're in a really crappy low resolution. Um, I'm also going to see if we have, yeah, so the last thing we want to install are the Intel IDE drive, uh, the, sorry, the Intel, um, Intel drivers for P55 chipset. So let's go to support.intel.com. So the chipset software installation utility installs drivers for things like USB, IDE, uh, the built-in network if your board has it, all that kind of stuff. We are running Windows 7 64-bit and we want to download drivers. Here. Windows updates done. We'll restart in just a minute. Um, okay, so this is the one we want. Uh, right now it's version 9.11.1025. I don't want to fill out a survey. I do want to download the file. Now you don't. You want to make sure you reboot in between downloading stuff. So we're going to download this. We're going to download the ATI drivers. Then we're going to reboot and install the stuff. Okay, so first I'm going to install the chipset drivers. It's extracting some files. I press next. I agree to the license without reading it, just like everyone else does. I press next again. It's going to do some beeping and bloping and all that kind of stuff. Next. Wait, okay. And it's okay if your mouse or keyboard kind of wig out during that, because it's actually updating your USB drivers. Yes, I would like to restart this computer now. The one having the SSD is really money because all these reboots take a lot less time. Okay, so everything's pretty awesome. Minesweeper works. We know that. We're good. Uh, let's close the case up. 
uh, finish up the machine and uh, we'll be good to go. So that's how to build an awesome $1,500 gaming PC. Takes about an hour, needed a screwdriver. Not as hard as you think it is, it's kind of like putting Lego together. For Tested, I'm Will Smith, thanks for watching. Oh, oh my goodness. That's not my fault. Mine's exploding. This is the problem with uh, this is a new version of Minesweeper. <laughs> this is like Minesweeper 2010.